I'm speaking with Professor Mark Harrison, co-author of The Industrialization of Soviet Russia, Volume 7, The Soviet Economy and the Approach of War, 1937 to 1939. Thank you for speaking with me. Uh, thank you. So first, um, tell me how you got into studying and writing on this subject. It probably goes back to my school days. Uh, I first visited the Soviet Union in 1964, when I was still at school, and it was an unforgettable experience. Uh, and I came back to it later, after I'd done my first degree in economics, uh, I decided that economic history was an important thing to be to study. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had good fortune to have teachers who were interested in Russia, uh, and I started studying Soviet economic history at that time. Uh, I became a graduate student, and again I was able to visit the Soviet Union to study in Moscow uh, in uh, 1972. Mm -hmm. At that time I was working on agriculture. I was interested in the peasantry, in the history of the peasantry. Uh, but I realized uh, how important the war was in, in the memory of the Soviet state and its people. Uh, it was unavoidable. And uh, my interest in Soviet agriculture ha had, had limits, as I discovered. Mm -hmm. And when I started to think about a new topic, I thought I'd like to work a bit more on the, the economic history of the Soviet Union nearer to the present day, which at that time, as I said, was uh, in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. And I thought that the war was something they were very proud of, and a lot was written about the war, and therefore it would be possible to find out things about the war that might not be possible to find out about periods before or after. And I began to do research and to write about the Soviet Union in World War II. So, uh, 30 or 40 years later, I've come back to it with this book, mm -hmm. in which I, I have a you know, a, a share that's important to me, but I'm one of four co-authors co mm -hmm. um, uh, who come together for this uh, particular project. Okay. Um, so tell me about the book then. How do you, does it just go chronologically and you focus on certain key events or ha how does it break out? Well, the, the book is part of a series. Mm -hmm. So I think the best way I can describe it is to explain its place in the series. Uh, our senior author, Bob Davis, began writing the series back in the 1970s. The first volume appeared in 1980. Uh, before that, he was a collaborator with the uh, historian E.H. Carr, Edward Hallett Carr, who began to write a history of the Bolshevik Revolution right after World War II. Uh, Carr looked at the Soviet Union and its role in World War II and decided that Soviet industrialization was the most important event of the 20th century. And he started to write a history of the Bolshevik Revolution and the Soviet state, and he got up to the end of the 1920s. At that point, he kind of gave up because, I think probably for two reasons. One is that he himself was getting on, and the other was he thought that he was entering the period of very strict Soviet censorship, and it would be, would be too difficult to find documentary evidence. Uh, but his, uh, for his volume at the end of the 1920s, when Stalin was just preparing the first five-year plan and uh, the collectivization of agriculture, uh, he decided he wanted an economist to help him, so he asked Bob Davis uh, to join him. And then he ended his series, and Davis started his series in turn, which began in 1929, and uh, uh, the volume that takes us up to World War II, which is the volume that's just been published, is the final volume of the series. Mm -hmm. Now, that series has been going on for most of my career, uh, and uh, I've known the people involved in it and co-authored on small projects with some of them. But this is the first time that I was drawn into to the, uh, uh, the uh, seven volumes mm -hmm. of the history of Soviet industrialization. Uh, my other co-authors are Davis himself, who uh, uh, I, I guess is probably you know, the, the most important living historian of the Soviet economy. Um, uh, Alia Klyavnyuk, who is a, a Russian historian uh, working and living in, in Moscow, uh, who's written a great deal about Stalin, uh, about uh, the, the, the history of the Stalin period, the politics and the 
policy making of the period, and especially the purges, and uh, Stephen Wheatcroft. Now, uh, Stephen is an expert on agriculture, on the census and statistics. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, really the, the four of us. Uh, much of my life has been spent working on Soviet statistics, on uh, the defense industry, military procurement, um, and more recently, security. Mm-hmm. So uh, the previous volume took us up to 1936. Uh, and 1936 was not a bad year in Soviet economic history. It was a period of relative uh, prosperity. It came after uh, a recovery from the economic crisis of the early 1930s, which was dreadful for millions of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, uh, the last volume, volume seven, deals with many uh, dark and desperate uh, events that followed. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Great Terror, uh, the uh, arrest and execution of uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people, uh, and war preparations, of which really I think the Great Terror can be seen as part, because it was Stalin's attempt to uh, settle with the internal enemy before uh, war could break out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, uh, that's how we come to where we are now. So one question I have, and my I, I, I'm not very familiar with this subject, um, and my questions might be somewhat a- ignorant, so please correct me if, if needed. Um, was, at this point, um, the Soviet Union appeared to be a complete, and pardon the, how strong this word is, but almost a slave state, you know, with a police state making sure that people produced as much as possible. Um, what, what was the point of that? You know, what was the Soviet Union focused on? That's uh, an excellent question, and uh, far from an ignorant one. Um, There is, I think, no real consensus among historians. Uh, There's a great deal of history of the civilian side of the the Soviet uh, development project. And I would say that uh, when I began in this field, many economists thought of the Soviet Union as a kind of civilian developmental state uh, in which uh, uh, thermonuclear weapons and the secret police were sort of regrettable uh, incidental byproducts. Uh, as time has, uh, I'm sure at that time I shared that view, but as time has gone by, I've come to another view, which is that rather the building of military power, of national power in the broadest sense, uh, was the essence of the project, and that the nuclear weapons that came by the end of the war and the uh, um, uh, the secret police were essential parts of this project, mm-hmm. and that many of the things you know that, that we can look back and say, well, the Soviet state did this well, you know, literacy programs, public health, and so on were very much uh, auxiliary to the idea of building national capabilities Mm -hmm. and of uh, making uh, the Soviet state as strong as possible and as secure as possible against both external and internal enemies. So who were the real stakeholders? Because I can't imagine, you know, the millions of workers had much say in what, what the direction they wanted the Soviet Union to go into. Was it basically Stalin and his circle, or was there sort of a broader group um, that felt the need for this military power? I think that building national power uh, can be a meaningful project to millions of people. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, You look at the history of every great power, and I include Britain, I include the United States, France and so on, there are periods when millions of people can take pride in belonging to a great power Mm -hmm. and can identify with uh, that particular project. So uh, I don't want to draw this too narrowly. Mm -hmm. I will say that in terms of decision making, the Soviet state was extraordinarily centralized. It's 
absolutely remarkable. You know, when, when you look at the agenda of the Politburo, the Politburo was a handful of people around Stalin who took uh, decisions really that nobody could challenge, mm-hmm. and they spent most of their time on trivia. That is, you know, what should be the price of cauliflowers in the Moscow market? Where are we going to put this statue? How are we going to price opera tickets? Um, of course, they also decided matters of great state importance, but they were continually bombarded by questions that people down below them were throwing up to them because nobody dared to resolve them, mm-hmm. knowing the nature of the power system. And so uh, if you say, you know, was this a good use of uh, scarce decision-making capacity? I'm going to say no, but it was also an intrinsic part of the system. It was extraordinarily centralized. So if, if by stakeholders you mean people who had a voting share, it was a very, very narrow project. Mm-hmm. If you mean the people, who, not who felt they had a say, but who, who felt enlivened by this and who felt mobilized by that, by it, but were willing to put effort into it, then it was a much broader thing, for sure. Mm-hmm. You know, we talk about mobilization. And it was a mass mobilization of society um, in which lots of different people could find different ways of deriving some sort of benefit, or whether it's a psychological benefit or a material benefit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, the, the, the issue of stakeholders is an important one, I think, because as you go beyond the Stalin period and you come into the post-war period, you look at the way that the Soviet Union evolved, the way that other East European states evolved, or today how China has evolved, Mm-hmm. You can say that you know, the concept of stakeholder communism broadened. So by the 1960s and the 70s, the Soviet Union was deliberately trying to involve experts and managers in decision making in ways that Stalin would not really have tolerated. Mm-hmm. Uh, in that sense, you can say that the Stalin state was totalitarian. Um, it began to evolve in something a bit different. If you look at China today, what's the the thing that the Chinese Communist Party has done that is different from what the Soviets did or the East Europeans did is it's admitted private entrepreneurs into the into the stakeholding class. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think the idea of stakeholders in communism is an important one, but when we look at the Soviet Union in the 1930s, the number of stakeholders in the decision making sense, you know, the people with a voting share was extremely small, very, very restricted. Now, did the industrial um, aspect of, of this society allow them to control areas further from the um, from the capital, say? Were they able to efficiently control those, or was there did outlying areas sort of manage on their own? Were they sort of uh, freer from central control than, than cl- those closer in? Uh, I would say in the 1930s, not much. Uh, so you can think of this uh, in, in various levels of activity. So if you think, first of all, about information, you know, how the sender was informed and how the sender transmitted its demands mm-hmm. and how the sender shared information, by the time you get to the interwar period, for the first time, you're looking at a period of history where a capital city could reach every province and every remote village through the press and the radio. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, the, really the first time in history uh, that that could be done. And so it was possible to exert a centralized control of information and censorship over every village newspaper. You know, they could monopolize the press. They could monopolize the radio. And these were the important things. Uh, uh, and, and so the party line could be transmitted to more or less every single uh, dweller, directly or indirectly, no matter how remote. Mm-hmm. If you then, uh, uh, if you th- th- think about the, you know, the, the rule of the secret police, the secret police could have an office in every every town and city, mm-hmm. and could extend its roll into the countryside around. And so, you know, when Stalin orchestrated the Great Terror, uh, the, the so-called mass operations 
1937 to 38. Uh, he could conduct it from Moscow and out in the provinces, hundreds of miles from uh, 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 the nearest uh, railway. People could be arrested, uh, deported, uh, executed, uh, more or less according to quota. Mm -hmm. Now, if you turn to the economy, you can think about the, the, the sectors that would seem most naturally amenable to that kind of control. You can think about uh, manufacturing industry and uh, transport, railway transport. And uh, again, you find a very high degree of centralized control over these sectors. And once evidence in favor of that is that when you come to 1937, uh, this was a year in which Stalin had arrested and, uh, and sometimes before, sometimes after dismissal, <laughs> mm. a very high proportion of the central administrative class. Mm -hmm. So the, the party officials who were administering the coal industry, the steel industry, uh, the railway industry, uh, electric power, the mining and so on, these people were, being, were falling left, right and centre. Mm -hmm. And as they were arrested, production sagged. You can see that you know, actually these people were important to the coordination of the economy and arresting them and getting rid of them made a difference. Agriculture is a slightly different story. Uh, so, you know, we think of agriculture as an activity that goes on everywhere regardless, where people settle, they will grow things, they will feed their animals. And Russia is a country where for hundreds of years, you know, the seasons came and went and peasants went out and sowed the fields and harvested without anybody really telling them what to do or when to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, Stalin changes all this. Agriculture is collectivized. And through the 1930s, there evolves this system of planning the basic agricultural operations. Uh, it starts with plowing, sowing, uh, reaping, threshing. Uh, and uh, also the growing of livestock, the, the uh, growing of young animals uh, and the harvesting of, their, of the meat of the older animals and so on. All this thing takes on a rhythm that is dictated by, by the state. Mm -hmm. So here what's remarkable is that in 1937, the same thing happens to the officials. The officials are relentlessly purged and... As far as production happens, nothing really goes wrong. Hmm. And in fact, things don't just not go wrong, they go very right. And there's very good harvest weather, growing and harvesting weather in 1937. And there's a record harvest, despite the fact that the people at the centre who are telling everybody what to do are being exposed as traitors and spies and sent off to the gulag or shot. Um, other things go wrong in agriculture from the point of view of the state, but not production. Mm. What goes wrong in agriculture is there's an abundant harvest, which for Stalin is, in the end, a kind of negative. Mm. And it's a negative in two ways. One is because until the harvest came in, everybody was telling him to be cautious. The harvest the year before was bad. Everybody's worried about a famine, a repeat famine, because there was a terrible famine in 1932. And they're telling him, you know, don't be too ambitious, don't make the plans too high. So he doesn't. The harvest comes in well above the plan. And because the state is not ready for it, the people who benefit from the harvest and not the state officials who should be out there gathering it in for the benefit of the state, but the peasants themselves. They bring the harvest in and they uh, store it away in their own little stores. And they, and as a result, the private sector in agriculture grows. And so for Stalin, this looks like a threat. Mm. This is the restoration of capitalism because the state was not ready. Um, and this makes him even more suspicious of those agricultural officials. There's a mm. kind of vicious circle going on there. Yeah. So, so uh, you, you get the sense of this state that wants to control everything and has undreamed of capabilities of controlling everything, and yet 
things can still go wrong and things can still happen in those remote corners of the country where party authority can kind of reach but not completely mm-hmm. so let me ask about um how the central authority decided um what to manufacture and you know on one hand you could manufacture uh, agricultural equipment or, or more manufacturing equipment, you know, to produce value, or you can produce, uh, weapons, which, you know, the, it's hard to determine what the value is of security, um, and, and weapons. So what was the threat that the central authority was building up to face and how did they decide, you know, that ratio? Uh, okay. So in terms of, how they decided it, I think we now know the answer. That is, the Politburo itself, I mean, it did spend time on statistics of steel production and machine tools and aircraft and tanks and so on. Mm-hmm. But the really important things that it, decisions that it made were really two. And these were budgetary decisions. That is, it decided the defense budget mm-hmm. and it decided the investment budget. Mm-hmm. And uh, those two things, they were decided in rubles, in cash, and that resulted in disbursements to, uh, to the military to buy soldiers and kit and to the industrial production ministries to build new factories. And then the disaggregation into particular targets and the p- particular commodities went on in a kind of iterative way, so... There were proposals coming up. Stalin was always very interested in military technology. So there's always a lot of discussion in the Kremlin about this gun or this tank or this plane. Um, uh, and then people were trying to work out, well, what are the implications for steel production, for coal production? Which railways do we need to link up the defense factories and the materials and so on? So, uh, you know, th- there's a lot of toing and froing, a lot of detailed conversation. But the two key decisions were really these, you know, how much cash to give to the military, how much cash to give to the, uh, to, to the industries that are building stuff. And, and Stalin had a, you know, a kind of intuitive yet sophisticated understanding. He wanted to allocate as much as possible to these things, but he also knew you could give too much. Mm-hmm. If you gave too much to, uh, the, uh, to either of these budgets, Prices would go up, and so this was a, an economy in which you know, there was a high degree of central control over prices, but nonetheless the people down below could play games and find ways of extracting more rubles from the system than Stalin figured they were entitled to. And the other is that the workers would complain, because if they, the workers didn't have enough to eat, uh, productivity would fall and the workers wouldn't go on strike necessarily in an explicit way, but they would just start working more slowly. And he knew this. Mm-hmm. And so he understood that you have to strike a balance. You give as much as possible uh, to construction, uh, economic construction, military construction, but beyond a point can be too much. And uh, so he, 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 you know, you, you can... He took decisions that in some ways look inconsistent over time. Sometimes he'd want to give more to the military budget, sometimes less. Mm -hmm. But the explanation is what people were telling him about the state of mind of the workers and the state of the economy. That's half your question. That's the question about how the decisions were made. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the threat that he was preparing against, you can see the threat changing over time. You know, in, in 1931, it's the Japanese. In 1935, it's becoming the Germans, and so on. But the the, the general, you know, the, the, the general principle was there will be war. We don't necessarily know with whom, but war will come. And the last time war came, Russia was not ready, and as a result, the regime was overthrown. So this was in World War One. Uh, Russia turned out to be ill-equipped to fight a modern war, and the result was eventually uh, military defeat, demoralization of the nation, uh, and an upri- well, successive uprisings that got rid of first the monarchy and then the provisional government, replacing it with the, the Bolsheviks. Mm-hmm. And Stalin was very determined not to have this happen again. And 
his orientation to this can be traced back to the 1920s, when the Soviet Union was, right from the start, continually engaged in border conflicts with the Poles, with uh, the, the Baltic Republics, uh, with uh, uh, Japan and the Far East. And every time there was any kind of um, emergency, he, he was uh, being told two kinds of things. And one is that the military were telling him, you know, bear in mind that if this does turn into a serious conflict, we are still not ready. And the reason we're not ready is because industry is too weak. We don't have the capacity to make the thousands of tanks and planes and guns that will be required in any major conflict. Mm -hmm. And you can see a series of war scares in the 1920s and the 1930s in which this is a consistent message. And, it, you know, it, it, I don't think it was necessarily a manipulative method. These, the people who were telling him this were party loyalists. Um, but, and, uh, you know, many of them were sort of clever, far-sighted people. And what evolved from this was a concept of future war. That is, the war that we had to prepare for was not the war that we might be faced with today, which will probably be fairly unimportant, mm -hmm. but the future war, which will be a mass war, a war of mass armies and mass motorization, uh, combined arms, and so on. And so uh, this was a very flexible concept, and it could deal with changing threats. So in 1931, Stalin saying, you know, Russia has always been weak, Russia has always been beaten, we have to make good the gap between Russia and the advanced countries in 10 years or they will crush us. And the enemy then was not Germany, it was, it was primarily Japan, mm -hmm. uh, maybe also the Poles. Um, uh, a few years later it's Germany, but uh, the same recipe is being pursued. The, the, the other message that Stalin is getting at this time comes from the security police. And what the security police is telling him is that every time there's a military emergency, it, un it unsettles the country, it unsettles the people. Uh, the people start thinking, is there going to be a war? Who will attack us? Who is going to win? If there's a war, will we get weapons? And if we get weapons, who will we shoot? And there's quite a lot of people who are saying, give us guns and we'll shoot the communists. And this is reported to Stalin, and he draws the appropriate conclusion, which is that the internal enemy can be just as dangerous as the external enemy, especially when they act together. Mm -hmm. Then the threat is multiplied. So from this time you see his determination to prevent any kind of coordination between internal and external opposition, and to repress the internal opposition before it can uh, influence the outcome of a crisis. Mm -hmm. um, my colleague, Alia Klyavnyuk, um, is one who pointed out that Stalin was terribly impressed by the Spanish Civil War, mm -hmm. not just because it was a precursor of the conflict between fascism and communism, but because of uh, the Spanish general Mola, who, when asked which of his four columns would take Madrid, said, Madrid will be taken by my fifth column, which is already inside the gates. Mm. And uh, Stalin formed from this and similar experiences the idea, I think, of a preemptive war against the internal opposition, um, uh, which he then carried out in, in, the, in the Great Terror, you know, trying to exterminate traitors, in some cases traitors before they even realized that they might be traitors. <laughs> You know, the, the potential enemy. Right. Stalin develops the concept not only of the potential enemy, but also of the unconscious enemy. Uh, you can find that as early as uh, 1932. He's writing about the unconscious enemy. That is the enemy who doesn't realize that when they're put under pressure, they will turn against us. And therefore has to be exterminated now. So do you know if... So in their military thinking, I, I'm curious who, if you know any principal advisors that he had, and were they building up uh, defensively to match any any force that might come against them, or were they building to overcome an enemy? Was that the goal, to, to take it to the enemy, so to speak? Well, I think uh, that was always 
the goal to take it to the enemy. Mm-hmm. I mean, for for much of the 1930s, his um, most forceful advisor was Marshal Tukhachevsky, mm-hmm. uh, who um, you know, the, 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 there's a group of generals who, who go back to this concept of the future war, and uh, Tukhachevsky was one of them. Uh, um, and um, uh, Tukhachevsky was a keen advocate of the offensive. Uh, I think um, Tukhachevsky understood, he expected the next war to be a war of manoeuvre, and he was one of those who understood that sometimes you have to defend in depth, you have to give way and then regroup and then launch the counter-offensive. Um, uh, in, towards the end of the 1930s, Stalin lost trust in Tukhachevsky, and Tukhachevsky was, I guess, you know, the most famous military victim of the Great Terror. Mm. Um, and because uh, Tukhachevsky was purged, some of his ideas were also purged. And you then enter a period between 1938 and 1941 where uh, the idea of a frontier defense became much more uh, prominent. But the idea of frontier defense was always to defeat the enemy at the frontier and then invade the enemy's territory. Mm-hmm. So it, it, uh, the, um, uh, it was never purely defensive in the sense of um, simply restoring the status quo before the war. Do you get the sense that the Soviet Union, if it had the chance and the resources, would have struck the first blow against someone, or were they waiting for for an attack, and then they would basically counterpunch. Well, it's clear that the Soviet Union was capable of striking the first blow. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, you, you think of the war with Finland, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, or you think of the war with Poland in 1920. Um, but I think that... Uh, so... The capability was there, and the, I think the, you know, the willingness to conceive of it was there. There's also a, a simple empirical question, was the Soviet Union actually planning to strike the first blow against Germany? And that, and that has been a, a popular hypothesis at some times. I mean, th- this is not something in which I've specialised, so I can only report the opinion of the people that I, that I the historians that I trust. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, um, people like uh, Gabriel Gorodetsky and Teddy Aldricks have written about this and have, I think, made the point compellingly that there is no clear documentary evidence that Stalin was intending to strike the first blow. Rather, he thought in 1941 that he had done all that was necessary to deter Hitler from attacking. Um, uh, and... So he was very reluctant to believe that war had begun when Hitler did attack. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, uh, as I say, that, that's not something in which I claim any particular expertise, mm-hmm. but that's the view of the historians that I believe. And, and I ask the question because I'm thinking about how when war did start, the U.S. provided so much material to the Soviet Union uh, to wage war you know, on its own behalf. I'm wondering how much... How much when it, how much Soviet thinking took that into account that maybe they would get a huge amount of material lent by by allies? I don't think that was imagined. Mm-hmm. And after all, until 1941, uh, the Soviet Union's ally was Germany. Mm-hmm. Uh, Stalin regarded you know, uh, uh, Britain in particular and the United States essentially as enemies, and uh, as I'm sure you know, was in the middle of carrying out an intelligence war against both Britain and America, Mm -hmm. uh, in the sense of uh, working hard to place agents and informers uh, at various levels of the government apparatus and uh, in industry and science and so on in the United States and in Britain. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I don't think there was forethought um, uh, of the possibility of that kind of allied assistance. Mm -hmm. I think initially Stalin was bewildered by the the character of the war that suddenly enveloped him. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. There's, a, there's the well-known story that comes essentially from uh, Mika Jan's recollection, recollections that, uh, uh, and I, uh, Stalin you know, kept things together for a few days after the German attack, and then he went to his dacha in the countryside and was uh, more or less incommunicado for almost a week. Um, some historians argue that he was kind of testing his subordinates you know, to see if they would be loyal to him. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of skeptical about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I suspect this was the one time in his life when he was depressed and he thought that everything that was everything was uh, coming to an end. Um, but you know, this is speculation. Uh, what we do know is that at the end of those few days, his colleague went to him and said, Comrade Stalin, uh, and according to, to, to uh, Mika Yana at this point, Stalin looked as if he thought they would come to arrest him. Hmm. And then they said, we've come to ask you to head the war cabinet. And he brightened up and said, OK, <laughs> and took, took charge again. <laughs> So I, I, I don't think Stalin foresaw the character of the war that was coming, and I, I, I think he found it at first bewildering. Mm -hmm. But being the sort of person he was, he did quickly pull himself together. Mm -hmm. But it was the one time in his life when he was actually distraught. So in 1939, does the book talk uh, talk about um, or discuss any changes in industrialization uh, once uh, Poland was invaded? You know, it's just a few, it's near the end of 1939. But do you get into any of those last few months? Uh, not so as you notice. I mean, we 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 discuss uh, the economics of the Nazi Soviet Pact a bit, mm -hmm. um, but uh, the, the, to most intents and purposes, the narrative uh, comes to an end with the outbreak of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, I mean we, we know a little more than than we're saying in the book. Um, okay, so what's happening between 1937 and 39 is very rapid rearmament, mm -hmm. uh, very big increases in uh, uh, expenditure on military construction and uh, defense industry construction. Uh, economic growth more or less comes to a standstill. Uh, 1939 to 41 is uh, an interesting period, partly because uh, there's a sudden territorial expansion. And so uh, into the Baltic and into eastern Poland, these territories are Sovietized, which means that uh, the first priority is to purge the population, uh, to deport or imprison uh, substantial numbers of the former elite, mm -hmm. the property-owning classes, the intellectual classes, and so on, bring the press and schools and so on under control, work out what to do with the church because you know, these are Catholic areas and the Catholic church was a multinational church which the Soviets had to find a new way to deal with. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so there's a sudden expansion of resources available to the Soviet economy. Uh, but there is no growth in the sense of improvement of productivity, uh, just the, you know, the structural changes that, that stem both from the uh, expansion over land mm -hmm. and the continuing pace of rearmament. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let me uh, turn to uh, the resources you used for the, the research in this book. Sure. Um, what, what did you, you know, what archives or where did you go for your information? Well, we, we use several archives. Uh, primarily, uh, there's a state archive, a party archive, and an archive of the economy. So these are three separate archives. The state archive and the archive of the economy are very closely linked. Uh, they're, um, they're sort of uh, substantially housed on the same premises. And uh, there's also a party archive, which is uh, a little distance away in, 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 in Moscow. So uh, the materials that in, in this book um, uh, are materials that my co-authors have gathered over many years. Uh, I came into the writing of it fairly late, uh, so uh, I've also worked in these archives and also in the military archive, uh, but on projects that have fed into the book rather than form part of the book itself. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and uh, but I, I I know these archives personally, and I know the character of the documentation mm -hmm. that's gone into the book. 
Uh, so, uh, I mean, the, 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 the basis of it is essentially the, the, the Soviet Union forms the world's best documented dictatorship. Mm. And unlike Hitler, Stalin liked everything to be written down. Mm. So the quantity of documentation is just immense. So uh, the, the use of archives for this book has been purposeful, uh, and it's been we've been able to be purposeful because all of us have had many years of prior experience in these archives. Mm. But nonetheless, I'm sure there are many many things waiting to be discovered that we don't know about yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we can be co- fairly confident of the outlines of the story, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, n- nonetheless. Um, I suspect that this series will, you know, in 50 years time, it, I hope it will still be regarded as a monument, but it will not be the last word. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, the records of party meetings, the records of who Stalin met with, his private correspondence. We're talking about uh, surveys and censuses, mm-hmm. uh, the primary records and the reports of them. Uh, uh, investigations that the state carried out into its own activities. Uh, you know, it's almost limitless, the character and, and the type of documentation that is available, is available now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's true that access to Soviet archives today is not as free as it was 10 years ago, mm-hmm. uh, 15 years ago. But, Nonetheless, the, the erosion of openness uh, for, for people like us has been at the edges. Mm-hmm. I think economic historians are often fortunate in the sense that we're looking, not so much looking for sensational material that somebody might have an interest in suppressing, mm-hmm. as in trying to understand the routine, uh, you know, the everyday life of the official, um, which was sometimes bizarre and uh, dramatic and unsettling ways, but nonetheless, it's everyday life. So mm-hmm. we're often interested in the kind of details that other other people think are unimportant. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and so the archives that we work with are, are fortunately not being too much encroached upon. Mm-hmm. Probably the most serious loss has been, uh, so one of the things that has inter- interested us, and both I and uh, my colleague Bob Davis have worked on, mm-hmm. have been mobilization plans. Uh, plans to mobilize industry. Um, these are now regarded as somewhat sensitive again, mm. uh, despite the passage of you know, 70 or 80 years. Mm. Uh, uh, so, you know, th- there's, a, there's a lot that we know that we would never have known during the Cold War. Mm. And we, I would say we know far more about the Soviet economy than about some aspects of the German economy mm. uh, under Hitler. Although, well, uh, possibly that, you know, the, I, I'm talking in a future sense. Mm-hmm. One day we will know much more about it than we know about the German economy under Hitler. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, well I, I was going to note, um, you know, a lot of people like to comment or joke or, or just say, you know, the Germans are so meticulous, they keep records of everything, even during World War II, you know, they were keeping records of everyone they basically exterminated. Um, but, but but I find the Russians are just as much or more so as meticulous and, and kept records um, to that extent. Is is that correct? Yes, uh, and I think a, a difference between Hitler and Stalin is that Hitler relied a lot on trust uh, with his senior officials. Mm-hmm. So you know, it's, it's well known that, that there is no document that carries Hitler's signature uh, to exterminate all the Jews in Europe. Mm-hmm. Um uh, the, the, there's no record of a decision being made, mm-hmm. or, or, but, although anybody can see that a decision was made. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in Stalin's case, Stalin signed all of these things. You know, uh, there's absolutely no doubt. Mm-hmm. You, you know, to the day, sometimes to the hour when the decision was made. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's the difference. Uh, I think there was much less trust between Stalin and those around him than mm-hmm. there was between Hitler and his closest uh, adherents. Mm-hmm. Much less trust, and indeed you can see that you know, Stalin made a habit of, you know, if you if you once you lost trust in somebody, uh, uh, well, literally, mostly they were dead. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's. <laughs> I can't even imagine living under a, a, a system like that. Um, so, what part of the research um, have you found most enjoyable? And obviously, it's been decades long. But uh, what what part of it do you like? Okay, um, I'll, I'll mention uh, two or three things. I mean, one is just that I I love writing. And uh, uh, it, in bringing this book to the publisher, I think I, I, I enjoy nothing so much as just trying to make it readable. Mm. Um, and uh, so, you know, if, uh, so, uh, but that's for the reader to judge whether I succeeded or not. Mm. Uh, I'll tell you about the, the substance of this kind of work that I've enjoyed. Um, one of the things that uh, I decided to make a study of was secrecy. And uh, so I, I spent quite a few years working now on the subject of Soviet secrecy, the system of secrecy, what it was for. Mm-hmm. And I, I'll just tell you the moment that I formed the determination to do this study, which was I was sitting in the Red Army Archive, um reading about military procurement in the 1930s and, and, and reading a report by a soldier who worked for the Ministry of Defence about a visit to a tank factory. Now, uh, as I said earlier, the Red Army had a budget, and it used this budget, it allocated this budget among the weapons it needed to buy. And it was very difficult for the Red Army sometimes to spend its budget because people in industry uh, wanted to get a, they, they, they wanted to get as much money as possible for as little effort as possible. Mm-hmm. So they were always trying to gouge the buyer. And, uh, so it is a simple example. Uh, they were supposed to sell tanks or aircraft to the Ministry of Defense at cost plus a margin. Mm-hmm. There was a profit margin they were allowed to charge and that would be the price. That was the law. They were obliged to sell at that price. So this soldier, you know, he's a colonel, he's an engineer, he goes to the factory and he says, here's the tank we want, how much will it cost us? And the director looks him in the face and says, I can't tell you that. And the soldier says, well, why not? And the director says, well, our costs are a military secret. <laughs> and, and, and this guy is a, he's a soldier, he's come, he comes straight from the Ministry of Defence, he says, that's ridiculous. You have to tell me how much it costs. And the guy says, no, I'm not going to tell you. You know, here's the price, but I'm not going to tell you what it costs. <laughs> and and uh, this guy goes back to his ministry, and he gets onto the Ministry of Defense, who's Voroshilov, and he says, Voroshilov, write to the Ministry of Industry and tell them to tell this manager not to be such a bloody idiot. So these letters go up and down the hierarchy. Mm. And the interesting thing is, they make no difference at all. You know, you were talking earlier about how much control there really was. Mm-hmm. And uh, the people in the industry went on playing this game for half a century. They were still doing it in the 1980s. Right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so uh, I just remember reading this document and kind of laughing and thinking, secrecy is interesting. You know, there's, there's a lot here to find out. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, you know, you can think when the Soviet Union collapsed, the exciting thing for all of us was, first of all, that we could see the, all these secret documents mm-hmm. that we never thought we'd get to see, and, and there's millions of them. So just seeing them was exciting. Mm-hmm. And it just took me a long time to wake up to the fact that the system of secrecy itself required investigation. So that's one thing I've enjoyed. Another thing I've enjoyed is, more recently, I discovered uh, the archive of the Lithuania KGB, Hmm. This archive is in Vilnius, in Lithuania, and it's open. Uh, it's also on microfilm at the Hoover Institution in California. Hmm. And, and I've got to tell you that using microfilm is a lot easier than using paper. Hmm. So uh, I've, I've seen it in, 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 in both settings. Hmm. And this uh, Lithuania KGB archive is just so interesting because uh, you know a lot of it's from the time that I was a student in Moscow. I told you I was a student in Moscow in 1972. Mm-hmm. We were students. We went out there. We knew it was a police state. We didn't really know what it meant. I mean, many of us were, we were you know, we knew there was a Cold War going on. Uh, we didn't necessarily believe everything we were told about the West. So we, we were looking to see if there was a good side to the Soviet state. 
Uh, but we knew it was a police state, and we used to ask ourselves all these questions we had no answers to, like, uh, you know, uh, are, are we being followed? Do we have files? Do they listen to our conversations? Do they care who we talk to? Do they care who our friends are? Uh, do they care whether we, you know, talk about what we know about the West? And we had no idea. And when we came away, we still had no idea. And, and now I can, you know, look at these documents that are in Vilnius and Lithuania, mm -hmm. and I can see how the Lithuania KGB approached foreign students, what it what it thought about them, what it did about them. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that, the, you know, I mean, my father's in Moscow. I, I may never get to see it. Mm -hmm. it um, but I can, on the basis of what I've seen in these Lithuania files, I can tell you the answers to all our questions was yes. Hmm. Uh, and it's just such fun finding this stuff out and finding out how the KGB actually operated. It's also chilling. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you know, this is, the period that I've been looking at is it's not a period of mass killings or a period when people were routinely tortured or anything. So it's not so brutal in that physical sense. Hmm. It's brutal in just in the sense of a banal indifference to. Uh, you know, it's like that, that phrase, is it uh, Hannah Arendt, you know, the banality of evil, mm -hmm. um, the sort of casual brutality with which they set out to control people. Yeah. It's fascinating, and, and that's been something that I've taken a kind of perverse pleasure in. So, in so you yeah. might have already answered this next question, but um, in your research, what was this thing you found that was most surprising? Huh. Probably... This. Okay, so before, during the Cold War, when everything was secret, we knew that the Soviet Union was very good at you know, building tanks and it could get into space and it had all these programs that seemed to be really just, you know, kind of, they were uh, politically directed missions, you know, a mission to space, a, a, a military mission and so on. And so it, it just seemed like, you know, the Politburo was giving orders and people were going out and doing these things and somehow or other it worked. And we had no idea how it worked. And once we had access to the archives, we could look inside and we could see that what was actually going on inside these black boxes was people behaving economically. That is, they were responding to the incentives that they were faced with. They were pursuing their own self-interest as they saw it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, just to, to, to give a simple example, um, how did the Soviet Union develop um, blue skies science? Or, uh, do I mean that? I'm not sure I mean blue, blue skies in the literal sense, but mm -hmm. if you think of an area of technology where the answer isn't known, Mm. How did they know what to fund? Uh, the thing I spent a lot of time looking at was jet propulsion in the 1930s. Mm. So in the 1930s, everybody knew that the internal combustion engine was reaching its limits in aviation. And they could see that in some far distant future, we would have rockets and jets, but they really didn't know how to build them. Mm. And so what was going to be, what was going to fill the gap? And they had no idea. And what you see is a kind of market springing up. It's a market for invention, and there's a supply side that's, uh, you know, there's a demand side, which is government officials who have a research budget and they don't know how to spend it. Mm -hmm. There's a supply side, which is inventors and designers who got ideas, and they want money. Mm -hmm. And just as in any market of that kind, uh, there's a mixture of people. Some of them are geniuses. Some of them are cranks. Some of them are frauds. Mm -hmm. Some of them, are, are ju they just want the money. And ex ante, they all look alike. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, in, in Britain, we have Frank Whittle, who uh, was uh, born in Coventry, where I'm talking to you from, mm -hmm. who invented the British jet engine. And he spent so much of his life with people thinking he was a crank. Mm -hmm. They... they they gave him little bits of money. They didn't really believe he knew what he was doing. And this, you know, he, he bore a grudge about this all his life. But the point is, you know, he looked just like the crazy people. Mm -hmm. 
because because he had an obsession. You know, he was an obsessive. <laughs> and uh, all these designers and inventors, they were either obsessives or they were charlatans. Mm -hmm. So, and you, here you've got to sympathise with the Soviet government official. How do you work out who to fund? Mm -hmm. And it was a real dilemma for them. So they spun the money out. I mean, they, they behaved a bit like research councils. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got the National Science Foundation, we've got our government research councils, mm -hmm. you know, trying to understand motivation, uh, trying to second guess what people are up to, not really, you know, lots, lots of brilliant people not getting the funding they deserved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because you only know they're brilliant afterwards. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but then you've, you've got the peculiarities of the Soviet system. So, and you've got Stalin, who, whose view was, every now and then, you shake things up with a bit of terror. Uh, terror will frighten off the charlatans. Hmm. You know, if you suddenly execute 10%, yeah. Yeah. then the people who are genuinely just out for the money, they'll, they'll get frightened off. I mean, that's kind of a rationalization of what he did, but it, you know, uh, it, 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 I think in some ways it, it, it kind of works. So d discovering that people could behave economically in this system, mm -hmm. that's, that's that was the interesting thing for me, that people were just, you know, behaving as, as an economist might kind of predict in this very weird setting. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that, that was the surprising thing for me. Was there a, an issue um, that uh, you had particular difficulty getting a, a, finding a conclusion on or getting to conclusion on or maybe you still haven't? Um, I'm sure you have many questions, but d does anything stick out? I would say there's a couple of things, and, and they're very different. Mm -hmm. One of them is, I mean, we ourselves, as co-authors, we still argue about the logic of the terror. Mm -hmm. You know, when Stalin picked out a particular official uh, for arrest and execution, was it... Um, was it a loss of trust or was it just random? Mm -hmm. If you lost trust in an official, was it connected with policy? Uh, I would say that the, one of the biggest issues that historians have wrestled with over the years has been the extent to which there were divisions of policy within the Soviet elite that gave rise to sort of visible uh, tensions and conflicts. And uh, I would say increasingly over time, as we've got to know more about these purges, you know, the temptation is to say, well, it was all random. Uh, anybody could have been picked out at any time. Uh, you know, the, the criteria were essentially arbitrary. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then there are so many occasions when you can kind of start to tell a plausible story about why so-and-so fell foul of Stalin at, at a particular time. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, for, you know, to, to give an example, the agricultural officials were being purged through this 1937-38, just like the people in industry and planning and statistics and so on. Um, why did Stalin pick on them when agriculture was apparently doing so well? Was it because uh, they failed to forecast the good harvest? Was it because they failed to plan to collect it for the state? Or was it just because it was agriculture's turn, you know? Mm. Um, yeah. uh, and I'm not sure whether we will ever get to the bottom of that. Mm. Um, uh, another thing uh, I think probably takes us back to one of your earlier questions, which was the economy of 1937 to 41 mm. and the, the economic significance of the Nazi-Soviet pact. And I think that uh, this is something about which we can find out more, and, and we probably need uh, a fresh study of this 1939 to 41 period. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've got to tell you, I'm not doing it. <laughs> so that's a kind of in invitation if anybody's listening. <laughs> so what do you hope uh, the book will do? Well, uh, we we hope that we see the book as the as the capstone of the series. Mm -hmm. uh, we think that the book shows 
uh, not only a, you know, a number of interesting things that were happening at this time, but also it, it, it demonstrates that tendency to militarization. And we try to explain this, ter- this militarization not just in terms of uh, reaction to immediate threats, but in terms of a long-term goal of uh, building national power. So uh, we see that as an important lesson of the book and of the series. Mm-hmm. Um, we, from that point of view, we think it's wrong to say that the Soviet economy was just a failure. Mm-hmm. Because despite the horrendous costs and the human tragedies that followed in its wake, uh, Stalin did actually succeed in building uh, an economy that was adapted to the era of mass warfare. Mm-hmm. Um, and World War II proved that. Uh, you, know, you, you can perfectly well say that the Soviet Union might not have won the war without Allied assistance. It didn't defeat Nazi Germany on its own. Mm -hmm. And there are those who say, and I think there's something to be said for it, that in fact um, the role of the British and the Americans in defeating Germany is sometimes understated. Mm -hmm. People sometimes go too far the other way. Mm -hmm. However, it's clear that uh, the Soviet economy, from Stalin's perspective, was a success. built national power, it built a stable regime, sufficiently stable that he could withstand the devastating invasion, pull himself together mm-hmm. and uh, lead the country through it. Mm-hmm. Making mistakes all the way, but then everybody makes mistakes. You know, Churchill and Roosevelt made terrible mistakes as well. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Stalin was not the only one. And probably the costs of Stalin's mistakes were higher than the mistakes of Churchill and Roosevelt, but nonetheless, the war was won. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, yeah, so I, I think um, those are probably uh, among the more important things that we'd like to say. I'd like to add that the book does conclude with a chapter that summarizes the entire series. Yeah, uh, and so we hope that people will use that final chapter if they don't feel like sitting down to read 400 pages they'll use that final chapter as a way in mm-hmm. uh, to some of the previous volumes and so on uh, yes okay uh, can you speak to any difficulties you had um, you and your co-authors had in finishing the book uh, and getting it published and how you overcame those Well, our, our, our publisher has been fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Palgrave, previously Macmillan, I guess it's Palgrave Macmillan now, mm-hmm. uh, has published uh, the entire series. And um, uh, at one point, uh, Bob Davis said to me, just send them the book, they'll publish it. <laughs> I, I was a little bit more careful than that, but they've been very, very supportive mm-hmm. and uh, very uh, um, attentive to our various needs and requirements, not all of which were standard. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think it, it was, you know, it, it's always difficult to finish a book when uh, there's a tendency in scholarship to be perfectionist, mm-hmm. and uh, that's not always a, a good thing, and sometimes it, it inhibits the uh, finishing off of things. So uh, I think each of us has felt, okay, you have to draw a line, but there's this thing I, I don't know yet, and uh, um, you know, what are we going to do about that? Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, that's always a, a difficulty, but... It, perhaps that's one of the advantages of age, you know. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not sure if I should reveal this over the air, but I, I'm, uh, <laughs> um, my next birthday I'll be 70, and uh, uh, I increasingly have the feeling that one needs to finish things off. Hmm. So I, I, I think that's, um, you know, the previous stages of my career, the whip to finish things off was things like, you don't finish this off, you'll never be pr- promoted, or you, know, you won't be confirmed in your position. And that was a harsh discipline. I don't feel that now. 
Uh, but I do nonetheless feel that there is a, an external authority uh, that wants me to get it done. Mm. So um, yeah. that, that was the countervailing power that uh, uh, made us uh, finish the book in the end. Mm-hmm. Do you have a, a writing project that you are now working on now that this is done? Uh, I, I have uh, covered projects that both stem from my reading of these uh, wonderful Lithuania KGB files. Mm-hmm. One's a literary project, uh, which is about informers. Uh, so the idea is that uh, nobody tells the informers stories. Uh, the informers generally don't tell their own story, and nobody's interested in them because uh, they're not regarded as sympathetic figures. Mm-hmm. And uh, among the files that I found are a few that tell the stories of the informers, not necessarily in their own words, so um, one has to approach these things with caution. And um, indeed, perhaps something we could have talked about earlier is the extent to which you have to regard all of these historical documents with caution. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, it's something that I think experience helps with. Um, and uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether this is going to be a long article or a short book. It will tell... The, the stories of some informers. These are the stories that were collected by the KGB, I think, for training purposes. Mm-hmm. They wanted to explain to their agents how to handle, uh, they wanted to explain to their officers how to handle informers, mm-hmm. how to develop them, how informers would come to them, how they would make use of them, and how they would develop them. Mm-hmm. And what you learn from these stories, I, d- I don't think they're rep- representative, they're not intended to be representative, but they're extraordinarily varied. Uh, they're often touching in very unexpected ways. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, one can only be thankful that one was never faced with the dilemmas, uh, the, the moral and the physical dilemmas that these people were faced with when they decided to become informers. So mm-hmm. I think that could be interesting. And the other is a, a, a more quantitative project, which is about low-level political crime. You know, what was it that ordinary people did that brought them to the attention of the KGB uh, you know, the, the political equivalent of uh, uh, dropping gum in the street or breaking windows. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it would mean going to the bar and uh, getting drunk and cursing the communists or mm-hmm. uh, listening to Western radio, going to work and telling your workmates what you'd heard. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, it's very sort of minor infractions of social norms, uh, which the KGB regarded as potentially precursors to more serious offending. And so they had a kind of zero tolerance policing concept. Mm-hmm. that you have to step in quickly and uh, bring people up short uh, by by warning them that their behaviour was would not be tolerated if they continued. Mm-hmm. And so uh, they brought people in then for a little conversation, which I think was a genuine conversation. You know, It wasn't a brutal interrogation. It was just to say, look, we've noticed you. Uh, you have a problem. Uh, we'd like to help you uh, not to re-offend. Mm-hmm. And... Um, uh, I have hundreds of these records of these interviews. They're, again, they're very varied, although they all tend to follow a certain kind of template um, in terms of the responses that the KGB got. You know, first of all, the people involved would say, no, I didn't do it. And then the KGB would say, yes, you did. On Thursday, you did this. On Friday, you did that. And then the, the, the person being questioned would realize that actually the KGB knew everything. Yeah. And the reason they knew everything is because their friend, you know, their relative, uh, had been informing on them, mm-hmm. which meant you're on your own, you know, uh, and and at that point they crumbled and became very sincere and said, I will never do this again. And uh, and the rate of reoffending was astonishingly low. It was a very frightening experience. Mm-hmm. So I've got a lot of these records and I, I have uh, before too long to code them and um, get some uh, grasp of uh, who the offenders were uh, and uh, what they were up to. Yeah, I think that would be very interesting to see. Um, so where uh, where can people find your thoughts and, and, and writings? Do you have a website, social media, anything like that? Um, the easiest way to find me is just to Google Mark Harrison Warwick. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm at the University of Warwick. Americans pronounce it Warwick. Mm. Uh, W-A-R-W-I-C-K. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I have uh, some web pages, one that contains preprints of most things I've ever written, and uh, I also have a blog. So if you Google Mark Harrison blog Warwick, mm-hmm. Warwick, 
uh, you'll find me quite easily. Or Mark Harrison Soviet uh, mm. does as well. Uh, there is another Mark Harrison at Oxford. He's a medical historian, um, and we're sometimes confused. Uh, so if you end up on the website of the Wellcome Institute uh, for um, the Social History of Medicine in Oxford, it's the wrong one. Huh. Okay. <laughs> But also very interesting. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. All right, so that's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Yes, you uh, too. Thank you very much. Thank you. This podcast has been presented by War Scholar. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to visit warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com for more great interviews and military history information. Your visits help support this podcast. One of the best ways to provide feedback for this podcast is to rate me on iTunes. Please give me a good rating if you liked it, or feel free to give me a bad rating if you didn't. I'll use that feedback to make this a better podcast. You can also follow me on Instagram under Chris Alvarez War Scholar. That's Chris without an H. C R I S on Facebook under War Scholar, on YouTube under War Scholar 1945, and on Twitter under War Scholar. Thank you, and I hope you return to this podcast for more great military history.